Chapter 2. The biographer is now faced with a difficulty which it is better perhaps to confess than to gloss over. Up to this point in telling the story of Orlando's life, documents, both private and historical, have made it possible to fulfill the first duty of a biographer, which is to plod, without looking to right or left, in the indelible footprints of truth, unenticed by flowers, regardless of shade, on and on methodically till we fall plump into the grave and write finis on the tombstone above our heads. But now we come to an episode which lies right across our path, so that there is no ignoring it. Yet it is dark, mysterious, and undocumented, so that there is no explaining it. Volumes might be written in interpretation of it, whole religious systems founded upon the signification of it. Our simple duty is to state the facts as far as they are known, and so let the reader make of them what he may. In the summer of that disastrous winter which saw the frost, the flood, the deaths of many thousands, and the complete downfall of Orlando's hopes, for he was exiled from court, in deep disgrace with the most powerful nobles of his time, the Irish house of Desmond was justly enraged, the king had already trouble enough with the Irish not to relish this further addition, in that summer Orlando retired to his great house in the country and there lived in complete solitude. One June morning, it was Saturday the 18th, he failed to rise at his usual hour and when his groom went to call him he was found fast asleep. Nor could he be awakened. He lay as if in a trance, without perceptible breathing, and though dogs were set to bark under his window, cymbals, drums, bones beaten perpetually in his room, a gorse bush put under his pillow, and mustard plasters applied to his feet, still he did not wake, take food or show any sign of life for seven whole days. On the seventh day he woke at his usual time, a quarter before eight, precisely, and turned the whole posse of caterwauling wives and village soothsayers out of his room, which was natural enough, but what was strange was that he showed no consciousness of any such trance, but dressed himself and sent for his horse as if he had woken from a single night's slumber. Yet some change, it was suspected, must have taken place in the chambers of his brain, for though he was perfectly rational and seemed graver and more sedate in his ways than before, he appeared to have an imperfect recollection of his past life. He would listen when people spoke of the great frost or the skating or the carnival, but he never gave any sign, except by passing his hand across his brow as if to wipe away some cloud, of having witnessed them himself. When the events of the past six months were discussed, he seemed not so much distressed as puzzled, as if he were troubled by confused memories of some time long gone or were trying to recall stories told him by another. It was observed that if Russia was mentioned or princesses or ships, he would fall into a gloom of an uneasy kind and get up and look out of the window or call one of the dogs to him, or take a knife and carve a piece of cedar wood. But the doctors were hardly wiser than than they are now, and after prescribing rest and exercise, starvation and nourishment, society and solitude, that he should lie in bed all day and ride forty miles between lunch and dinner, together with the usual sedatives and irritants, diversified, as the fancy took them, with possets of newt slobber on rising, and drafts of peacock's gall on going to bed, they left him to himself, and gave it as their opinion that he had been asleep for a week. But if sleep it was, of what nature, we can scarcely refrain from asking, are such sleeps as these? Are they remedial measures, trances in which the most galling memories, events that seem likely to cripple life forever, are brushed with a dark wing which rubs their harshness off and gilds them, even the ugliest and basest, with a luster, an incandescence? Has the anger of death to be laid on the tumult of life from time to time lest it rend us asunder? Are we so made that we have to take death in small doses daily or we could not go on with the business of living? And then what strange powers are those that penetrate our most secret ways and change our most treasured possessions without our willing it? Had Orlando, worn out by the extremity of his suffering, died for a week, and then come to life again? And if so, of what nature is death and of what nature life? Having waited well over half an hour for an answer to these questions, and none coming, let us get on with the story. Now Orlando gave himself up to a life of extreme solitude. His disgrace at court and the violence of his grief were partly the reason of it, but as he made no effort to defend himself and seldom invited anyone to visit him, though he had many friends who would willingly have done so, it appeared as if to be alone in the great house of his father suited his temper. Solitude was his choice. How he spent his time, nobody quite knew. The servants, of whom he kept a full retinue, though much of their business was to dust empty rooms and to smooth the coverlets of beds that were never slept in, watched, in the dark of the evening, as they sat over their cakes and ale, a light passing along the galleries, through the banqueting halls, up the staircases, into the bedrooms, 
and knew that their master was perambulating the house alone. None dared follow him, for the house was haunted by a great variety of ghosts, and the extent of it made it easy to lose one's way and to either fall down some hidden staircase or open a door which, should the wind blow it to, would shut upon one forever accidents of no uncommon occurrence as the frequent discovery of the skeletons of men and animals in attitudes of great agony made it evident. Then the light would be lost altogether, and Mrs. Grimsditch, the housekeeper, would say to Mr. Duper, the chaplain, how she hoped his lordship had not met with some bad accident. Mr. Duper would opine that his lordship was on his knees, no doubt, among the tombs of his ancestors in the chapel, which was in the billiard table court, half a mile away on the south side. For he had sins on his conscience, Mr. Duper was afraid, upon which Mrs. Grimsditch would retort, rather sharply, that so had most of us, and Mrs. Stukeley and Mrs. Field and old nurse Carpenter would all raise their voices in his lordship's praise, and the grooms and the stewards would swear that it was a thousand pities to see so fine a nobleman moping about the house when he might be hunting the fox or chasing the deer, and even the little laundry maids and scullery maids, the Judies and the Fates, who were handing round the tankards and cakes, would pipe up their testimony to his lordship's gallantry for never was there a kinder gentleman, or one more free with those little pieces of silver which served to buy a knot of ribbon or put a posy in one's hair, until even the blackamoor whom they called Grace Robinson by way of making a Christian woman of her, understood what they were at, and agreed that his lordship was a handsome, pleasant, darling gentleman in the only way she could, that is to say by showing all her teeth at once in a broad grin. In short, all his serving men and women held him in high respect and cursed the foreign princess, but they called her by a coarser name than that, who had brought him to this pass. But though it was probably cowardice, or love of hot ale, that led Mr. Duper to imagine his lordship safe among the tombs so that he need not go in search of him, it may well have been that Mr. Duper was right. Orlando now took a strange delight in thoughts of death and decay, and, after pacing the long galleries and ballrooms with a taper in his hand, looking at picture after picture as if he sought the likeness of somebody whom he could not find, would mount into the family pew and sit for hours watching the banners stir and the moonlight waver with a bat or death's head moth to keep him company. Even this was not enough for him, but he must descend into the crypt where his ancestors lay, coffin piled upon coffin, for ten generations together. The place was so seldom visited that the rats had made free with the lead work, and now a thigh bone would catch at his cloak as he passed, or he would crack the skull of some old sermolese as it rolled beneath his foot. It was a ghastly sepulchre, dug deep beneath the foundations of the house as if the first lord of the family, who had come from France with the conqueror, had wished to testify how all pomp is built upon corruption, how the skeleton lies beneath the flesh, how we that dance and sing above must lie below, how the crimson velvet turns to dust, how the ring, here Orlando, stooping his lantern, would pick up a gold circle lacking a stone, that had rolled into a corner, loses its ruby and the eye which was so lustrous shines no more. Nothing remains of all these princes, Orlando would say, indulging in some pardonable exaggeration of their rank, except one digit, and he would take a skeleton hand in his and bend the joints this way and that. Whose hand was it? He went on to ask. The right or the left? The hand of man or woman, or age or youth? Had it urged the war horse, or plied the needle? Had it plucked the rose, or grasped cold steel? Had it? But here either his invention failed him or, what is more likely, provided him with so many instances of what a hand can do that he shrank, as his wont was, from the cardinal labor of composition, which is excision, and he put it with the other bones, thinking how there was a writer called Thomas Brown, a doctor of Norwich, whose writing upon such subjects took his fancy amazingly. So, taking his lantern and seeing that the bones were in order, for though romantic, he was singularly methodical and detested nothing so much as a ball of string on the floor, let alone the skull of an ancestor, he returned to that curious, moody pacing down the galleries, looking for something among the pictures, which was interrupted at length by a veritable spasm of sobbing, at the sight of a Dutch snow scene by an unknown artist. Then it seemed to him that life was not worth living any more. Forgetting the bones of his ancestors and how life is founded on a grave, he stood there shaken with sobs, all for the desire of a woman in Russian trousers, with slanting eyes, a pouting mouth and pearls about her neck. She had gone. She had left him. He was never to see her again. And so he sobbed. And so he found his way back to his own rooms, and Mrs. Grimstitch, seeing the light in the window, put the tankard from her lips and said praise be to God, his lordship was safe in his room again, for she had been thinking all this while that he was foully murdered. Orlando now drew his chair up to the table, 
opened the works of Sir Thomas Brown and proceeded to investigate the delicate articulation of one of the doctor's longest and most marvelously contorted cogitations. For though these are not matters on which a biographer can profitably enlarge, it is plain enough to those who have done a reader's part in making up from bare hints dropped here and under the whole boundary and circumference of a living person, can hear in what we only whisper a living voice, can see often when we say nothing about it, exactly what he looked like, know without a word to guide them precisely what he thought, and it is for readers such as these that we write, it is plain then to such a reader that Orlando was strangely compounded of many humors, of melancholy, of indolence, of passion, of love of solitude, to say nothing of all those contortions and subtleties of temper which were indicated on the first page, when he slashed at a dead nigger's head, cut it down, hung it chivalrously out of his reach again, and then betook himself to the window seat with a book. The taste for books was an early one. As a child he was sometimes found at midnight by a page still reading. They took his taper away, and he bred glowworms to serve his purpose. They took the glowworms away, and he almost burnt the house down with a tinder. To put it in a nutshell, leaving the novelist to smooth out the crumpled silk and all its implications, he was a nobleman afflicted with a love of literature. Many people of his time, still more of his rank, escaped the infection and were thus free to run or ride or make love at their own sweet will. But some were early infected by a germ said to be bred of the pollen of the asphodel and to be blown out of Greece and Italy, which was of so deadly a nature that it would shake the hand as it was raised to strike, cloud the eye as it sought its prey, and make the tongue stammer as it declared its love. It was the fatal nature of this disease to substitute a phantom for reality, so that Orlando, to whom fortune had given every gift, plate, linen, houses, men servants, carpets, beds in profusion, had only to open a book for the whole vast accumulation to turn to mist. The nine acres of stone which were his house vanished, one hundred and fifty indoor servants disappeared, his eighty riding horses became invisible, it would take too long to count the carpets, sofas, trappings, china, plate, cruets, chafing dishes, and other movables often of beaten gold, which evaporated like so much sea mist under the miasma. So it was, and Orlando would sit by himself, reading, a naked man. The disease gained rapidly upon him now in his solitude. He would read often six hours into the night, and when they came to him for orders about the slaughtering of cattle or the harvesting of wheat, he would push away his folio and look as if he did not understand what was said to him. This was bad enough and wrung the hearts of Hall, the falconer, of Giles, the groom, of Mrs. Grimsditch, the housekeeper, of Mr. Duper, the chaplain. A fine gentleman like that, they said, had no need of books. Let him leave books, they said, to the palsied or the dying. But worse was to come. For once the disease of reading has laid hold upon the system it weakens it so that it falls an easy prey to that other scourge which dwells in the ink pot and festers in the quill. The wretch takes to writing. And while this is bad enough in a poor man, whose only property is a chair and a table set beneath a leaky roof, for he has not much to lose, after all, the plight of a rich man, who has houses and cattle, maid servants, asses and linen, and yet writes books, is pitiable in the extreme. The flavor of it all goes out of him, he is riddled by hot irons, not by vermin. He would give every penny he has, such as the malignity of the germ, to write one little book and become famous yet all the gold in Peru will not buy him the treasure of a well-turned line. So he falls into consumption and sickness, blows his brains out, turns his face to the wall. It matters not in what attitude they find him. He has passed through the gates of death and known the flames of hell. Happily, Orlando was of a strong constitution, and the disease, for reasons presently to be given, never broke him down as it has broken many of his peers. But he was deeply smitten with it, as the sequel shows. For when he had read for an hour or so in Sir Thomas Brown, and the bark of the stag and the call of the night watchman showed that it was the dead of night and all safe asleep, he crossed the room, took a silver key from his pocket, and unlocked the doors of a great inlaid cabinet which stood in the corner. Within were some fifty drawers of cedar wood, and upon each was a paper neatly written in Orlando's hand. He paused, as if hesitating which to open. One was inscribed the death of Ajax, another the birth of Pyramus, another Iphigenia in Aulis, another the death of Hippolytus, another Meleager, another the return of Odysseus, in fact there was scarcely a single drawer that lacked the name of some mythological personage at a crisis of his career. In each drawer lay a document of considerable size all written over in Orlando's hand. The truth was that Orlando had been afflicted thus for many years. Never had any boy begged apples as Orlando begged paper, nor sweetmeats as he begged ink.
stealing away from talk and games, he had hidden himself behind curtains, in priests' holes, or in the cupboard behind his mother's bedroom which had a great hole in the floor and smelt horribly of starling's dung, with an inkhorn in one hand, a pen in another, and on his knee a roll of paper. Thus had been written, before he was turned twenty-five, some forty-seven plays, histories, romances, poems, some in prose, some in verse, some in French, some in Italian, all romantic, and all long. One he had had printed by John Ball of the Feathers and Coronet opposite St. Paul's Cross, Cheapside, but though the sight of it gave him extreme delight, he had never dared show it even to his mother, since to write, much more to publish, was, he knew, for a nobleman and an inexpiable disgrace. Now, however, that it was the dead of night and he was alone, he chose from this repository one thick document called Xenophila a tragedy, or some such title, and one thin one, called simply the oak tree, this was the only monosyllabic title among the lot, and then he approached the inkhorn, fingered the quill, and made other such passes as those addicted to this vice begin their rites with. But he paused. As this pause was of extreme significance in his history, more so, indeed, than many acts which bring men to their knees and make rivers run with blood, it behoves us to ask why he paused, and to reply, after due reflection, that it was for some such reason as this. Nature, who has played so many queer tricks upon us, making us so unequally of clay and diamonds, of rainbow and granite, and stuff them into a case, often of the most incongruous, for the poet has a butcher's face and the butcher of poets, nature, who delights in muddle and mystery, so that even now, November 1st, 1927, we know not why we go upstairs, or why we come down again, our most daily movements are like the passage of a ship on an unknown sea, and the sailors at the masthead ask, pointing their glasses to the horizon, is there land or is there none? To which, if we are prophets, we make answer yes, if we are truthful we say no, nature, who has so much to answer for besides the perhaps unwieldy length of this sentence, has further complicated her task and added to our confusion by providing not only a perfect ragbag of odds and ends within us, a piece of policeman's trousers lying cheek by jowl with Queen Alexandra's wedding veil, but has contrived that the whole assortment shall be lightly stitched together by a single thread. Memory is the seamstress, and a capricious one at that. Memory runs her needle in and out, up and down, hither and thither. We know not what comes next, or what follows after. Thus, the most ordinary movement in the world, such as sitting down at a table and pulling the inkstand towards one, may agitate a thousand odd, disconnected fragments, now bright, now dim, hanging and bobbing and dipping and flaunting, like the underlinen of a family of fourteen on a line in a gale of wind. Instead of being a single, downright, bluff piece of work of which no man need feel ashamed, our commonest deeds are set about with a fluttering and flickering of wings, a rising and falling of lights. Thus it was that Orlando, dipping his pen in the ink, saw the mocking face of the lost princess, and asked himself a million questions instantly which were as arrows dipped in gall. Where was she? And why had she left him? Was the ambassador her uncle or her lover? Had they plotted? Was she forced? Was she married? Was she dead? All of which so drove their venom into him that, as if to vent his agony somewhere, he plunged his quill so deep into the inkhorn that the ink spurted over the table, which act, explain it how one may, and no explanation perhaps is possible, memory is inexplicable, at once substituted for the face of the princess a face of a very different sort. But whose was it, he asked himself. And he had to wait, perhaps half a minute, looking at the new picture which lay on top of the old, as one lantern slide is half seen through the next, before he could say to himself, this is the face of that rather fat, shabby man who sat in Twitchett's room ever so many years ago when old Queen Bess came here to dine and I saw him, Orlando continued, catching at another of those little colored rags, sitting at the table, as I peeped in on my way downstairs, and he had the most amazing eyes, said Orlando, that ever were, but who the devil was he? Orlando asked, for here memory added to the forehead and eyes, first, a coarse, grease-stained ruffle, then a brown doublet, and finally a pair of thick boots such as citizens wear in Cheapside. Not a nobleman, not one of us, said Orlando, which he would not have said aloud, for he was the most courteous of gentlemen, but it shows what an effect noble birth has upon the mind and incidentally how difficult it is for a nobleman to be a writer, a poet, I dare say. By all the laws, memory, having disturbed him sufficiently, should now have blotted the whole thing out completely, or have fetched up something so idiotic and out of keeping, like a dog chasing a cat or an old woman blowing her nose into a red cotton handkerchief, 
that, in despair of keeping pace with her vagaries, Orlando should have struck his pen in earnest against his paper. For we can, if we have the resolution, turn the hussy, memory, and all her ragtag and bobtail out of the house, but Orlando paused. Memory still held before him the image of a shabby man with big, bright eyes. Still he looked, still he paused. It is these pauses that are our undoing. It is then that sedition enters the fortress and our troops rise in insurrection. Once before he had paused, and love with its horrid rout, its shams, its symbols, and its heads with gory locks torn from the shoulders had burst in. From love he had suffered the tortures of the damned. Now, again, he paused, and into the breach thus made, leapt ambition, the harridan, and poetry, the witch, and desire of fame, the strumpet, all joined hands and made of his heart their dancing ground. Standing upright in the solitude of his room, he vowed that he would be the first poet of his race and bring immortal luster upon his name. He said, reciting the names and exploits of his ancestors, that Sir Boris had fought and killed the Paynim, Sir Gawain, the Turk, Sir Miles, the Pole, Sir Andrew, the Frank, Sir Richard, the Austrian, Sir Jordan, the Frenchman, and Sir Herbert, the Spaniard. But of all that killing and campaigning, that drinking and lovemaking, that spending and hunting and riding and eating, what remained? A skull, a finger. Whereas, he said, turning to the page of Sir Thomas Brown, which lay open upon the table, and again he paused. Like an incantation rising from all parts of the room, from the night wind and the moonlight, rolled the divine melody of those words which, lest they should outstare this page, we will leave where they lie entombed, not dead, embalmed rather, so fresh is their color, so sound their breathing, and Orlando, comparing that achievement with those of his ancestors, cried out that they and their deeds were dust and ashes, but this man and his words were immortal. He soon perceived, however, that the battles which Sir Miles and the rest had waged against armed knights to win a kingdom, were not half so arduous as this which he now undertook to win an immortality against the English language. Anyone moderately familiar with the rigors of composition will not need to be told the story in detail, how he wrote and it seemed good, read and it seemed vile, corrected and tore up, cut out, put in, was in ecstasy, in despair, had his good nights and bad mornings, snatched at ideas and lost them, saw his book plain before him and it vanished, acted his people's parts as he ate, mouthed them as he walked, now cried, now laughed, vacillated between this style and that, now preferred the heroic and pompous, next the plain and simple, now the vales of Tempe, then the fields of Kent or Cornwall, and could not decide whether he was the divinest genius or the greatest fool in the world. It was to settle this last question that he decided, after many months of such feverish labor, to break the solitude of years and communicate with the outer world. He had a friend in London, one Giles Isham of Norfolk, who, though of gentle birth, was acquainted with writers and could doubtless put him in touch with some member of that blessed, indeed sacred, fraternity. For, to Orlando in the state he was now in, there was a glory about a man who had written a book and had it printed, which outshone all the glories of blood and state. To his imagination it seemed as if even the bodies of those instinct with such divine thoughts must be transfigured. They must have aureoles for hair, incense for breath, and roses must grow between their lips, which was certainly not true either of himself or Mr. Duper. He could think of no greater happiness than to be allowed to sit behind a curtain and hear them talk. Even the imagination of that bold and various discourse made the memory of what he and his courtier friends used to talk about, a dog, a horse, a woman, a game of cards seemed brutish in the extreme. He bethought him with pride that he had always been called a scholar, and sneered it for his love of solitude in books. He had never been apt at pretty phrases. He would stand stock still, plush, and stride like a grenadier in a lady's drawing room. He had twice fallen, in sheer abstraction, from his horse. He had broken Lady Winchelsea's fan once while making a rhyme. Eagerly recalling these and other instances of his unfitness for the life of society, an ineffable hope, that all the turbulence of his youth, his clumsiness, his blushes, his long walks, and his love of the country proved that he himself belonged to the sacred race rather than to the noble, was by birth a writer, rather than an aristocrat, possessed him. For the first time since the night of the great flood he was happy. He now commissioned Mr. Isham of Norfolk to deliver to Mr. Nicholas Green of Clifford's in a document which set forth Orlando's admiration for his works, for Nick Green was a very famous writer at that time, and his desire to make his acquaintance, which he scarcely dared ask, for he had nothing to offer in return, but if Mr. Nicholas Green would condescend to visit him, 
A coach and four would be at the corner of Fetter Lane at whatever hour Mr. Green chose to appoint, and bring him safely to Orlando's house. One may fill up the phrases which then followed, and figure Orlando's delight when, in no long time, Mr. Green signified his acceptance of the noble lord's invitation, took his place in the coach and was set down in the hall to the south of the main building punctually at seven o'clock on Monday 21st of April. Many kings, queens, and ambassadors had been received there, judges had stood there in their ermine. The loveliest ladies of the land had come there, and the sternest warriors. Banners hung there which had been at Flodden and at Agincourt. There were displayed the painted coats of arms with their lions and their leopards and their coronets. There were the long tables where the gold and silver plate was stood, and there the vast fireplaces of wrought Italian marble where nightly a whole oak tree, with its million leaves and its nests of rook and wren, was burnt to ashes. Nicholas Green, the poet, stood there now, plainly dressed in his slouched hat and black doublet, carrying in one hand a small bag. That Orlando as he hastened to greet him was slightly disappointed was inevitable. The poet was not above middle height, was of a mean figure, was lean and stooped somewhat, and, stumbling over the mastiff on entering, the dog bit him. Moreover, Orlando, for all his knowledge of mankind, was puzzled where to place him. There was something about him which belonged neither to servant, squire, or noble. The head with its rounded forehead and beaked nose was fine, but the chin receded. The eyes were brilliant, but the lips hung loose and slobbered. It was the expression of the face as a whole, however, that was disquieting. There was none of that stately composure which makes the faces of the nobility so pleasing to look at, nor had it anything of the dignified servility of a well-trained domestic's face, it was a face seemed, puckered, and drawn together. Poet though he was, it seemed as if he were more used to scold than to flatter, to quarrel than to coo, to scramble than to ride, to struggle than to rest, to hate than to love. This, too, was shown by the quickness of his movements, and by something fiery and suspicious in his glance. Orlando was somewhat taken aback. But they went to dinner. Here, Orlando, who usually took such things for granted, was, for the first time, unaccountably ashamed of the number of his servants, and of the splendor of his table. Stranger still, he bethought him with pride, for the thought was generally distasteful, of that great-grandmother Maul who had milked the cows. He was about somehow to allude to this humble woman and her milk pails, when the poet forestalled him by saying that it was odd, seeing how common the name of Green was, that the family had come over with the conqueror and was of the highest nobility in France. Unfortunately, they had come down in the world and done little more than leave their name to the royal borough of Greenwich. Further talk of the same sort, about lost castles, coats of arms, cousins who were baronets in the north, intermarriage with noble families in the west, how some green spelt the name with an E at the end, and others without, lasted till the venison was on the table. Then Orlando contrived to say something of Grandmother Maul and her cows, and had eased his heart a little of its burden by the time the wild fowl were before them. But it was not until the Malmsey was passing freely that Orlando dared mention what he could not help thinking a more important matter than the greens or the cows, that is to say the sacred subject of poetry. At the first mention of the word the poet's eyes flashed fire, he dropped the fine gentleman airs he had worn, thumped his glass on the table, and launched into one of the longest, most intricate, most passionate, and bitterest stories that Orlando had ever heard, save from the lips of a jilted woman, about a play of his, another poet, and a critic. Of the nature of poetry itself, Orlando only gathered that it was harder to sell than prose, and though the lines were shorter took longer in the writing. So the talk went on with ramifications interminable, until Orlando ventured to hint that he had himself been so rash as to write, but here the poet leapt from his chair. A mouse had squeaked in the wainscot, he said. The truth was, he explained, that his nerves were in a state where a mouse's squeak upset them for a fortnight. Doubtless the house was full of vermin, but Orlando had not heard them. The poet then gave Orlando the full story of his health for the past ten years or so. It had been so bad that one could only marvel that he still lived. He had had the palsy, the gout, the ague, the dropsy, and the three sorts of fever in succession, added to which he had an enlarged heart, a great spleen, and a diseased liver. But, above all, he had, he told Orlando, sensations in his spine which defied description. There was one knob about the third from the top which burnt like fire, another about the second from the bottom which was cold as ice. Sometimes he woke with a brain-like lead, at others it was as if a thousand wax tapers were alight and people were throwing fireworks inside him. He could feel a rose leaf through his mattress, he said, 
and knew his way almost about London by the feel of the cobbles. Altogether, he was a piece of machinery so finely made and so curiously put together. Here he raised his hand as if unconsciously, and indeed it was of the finest shape imaginable that it confounded him to think that he had only sold five hundred copies of his poem, but that, of course, was largely due to the conspiracy against him. All he could say, he concluded, banging his fist upon the table, was that the art of poetry was dead in England. How that could be with Shakespeare, Marlowe, Ben Jonson, Brown, Dunn. All now writing or just having written, Orlando, reeling off the names of his favorite heroes, could not think. Green laughed sardonically. Shakespeare, he admitted, had written some scenes that were well enough, but he had taken them chiefly from Marlowe. Marlowe was a likely boy, but what could you say of a lad who died before he was thirty? As for Brown, he was for writing poetry and prose, and people soon got tired of such conceits as that. Dunn was a mountebank who had wrapped up his lack of meaning in hard words. The gulls were taken in, but the style would be out of fashion twelve months hence. As for Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson was a friend of his, and he never spoke ill of his friends. No, he concluded, the great age of literature is past. The great age of literature was the Greek. The Elizabethan age was inferior in every respect to the Greek. In such ages, men cherished a divine ambition, which he might call la gloire. He pronounced it glor, so that Orlando did not at first catch his meaning. Now all young writers were in the pay of the booksellers and poured out any trash that would sell. Shakespeare was the chief offender in this way, and Shakespeare was already paying the penalty. Their own age, he said, was marked by precious conceits and wild experiments, neither of which the Greeks would have tolerated for a moment. Much though it hurt him to say it, for he loved literature as he loved his life, he could see no good in the present and had no hope of the future. Here he poured himself out another glass of wine. Orlando was shocked by these doctrines, yet could not help observing that the critic himself seemed by no means downcast. On the contrary, the more he denounced his own time, the more complacent he became. He could remember, he said, a night at the Cock Tavern in Fleet Street when Kit Marlowe was there and some others. Kit was in high feather, rather drunk, which he easily became, and in a mood to say silly things. He could see him now brandishing his glass at the company and hiccuping out, "Stap my vitals." Bill, this was to Shakespeare. There's a great wave coming, and you're on top of it. By which he meant, Green explained that they were trembling on the verge of a great age in English literature, and that Shakespeare was to be a poet of some importance. Happily for himself, he was killed two nights later in a drunken brawl, and so did not live to see how this prediction turned out. Poor foolish fellow," said Green, "to go and say a thing like that. A great age, forsooth, the Elizabethan a great age." So, my dear lord, he continued, settling himself comfortably in his chair and rubbing the wine glass between his fingers. We must make the best of it, cherish the past, and honor those writers. There are still a few left of them who take antiquity for their model and write, not for pay, but for glor. Orlando could have wished him a better accent. Glor, said Green, is the spur of noble minds. Had I a pension of three hundred pounds a year paid quarterly, I would live for glor alone. I would lie in bed every morning reading Cicero. I would imitate his style so that you couldn't tell the difference between us. That's what I call fine writing," said Green. "That's what I call glor. But it's necessary to have a pension to do it." By this time, Orlando had abandoned all hope of discussing his own work with the poet. But this mattered the less as the talk now got upon the lives and characters of Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, and the rest. All of whom Green had known intimately, and about whom he had a thousand anecdotes of the most amusing kind to tell. Orlando had never laughed so much in his life. These then were his gods. Half were drunken, and all were amorous. Most of them quarrelled with their wives. Not one of them was above a lie or an intrigue of the most paltry kind. Their poetry was scribbled down on the backs of washing bills held to the heads of printers' devils at the street door. Thus Hamlet went to press. Thus Lear. Thus Othello. No wonder, as Green said, that these plays show the faults they do. The rest of the time was spent in carousings and junketings in taverns and in beer gardens, when things were said that passed belief for wit, and things were done that made the utmost frolic of the courtiers seem pale in comparison. All this Green told with a spirit that roused Orlando to the highest pitch of delight. He had a power of mimicry that brought the dead to life, and could say the finest things of books provided they were written three hundred years ago. So time passed. And Orlando felt for his guest a strange mixture of liking and contempt, of admiration and pity.
as well as something too indefinite to be called by any one name, but had something of fear in it, and something of fascination. He talked incessantly about himself, yet with such good company that one could listen to the story of his ague forever. Then he was so witty, then he was so irreverent, then he made so free with the names of God and woman, then he was so full of queer crafts and had such strange lore in his head, could make salad in three hundred different ways, knew all that could be known of the mixing of wines, played half a dozen musical instruments, and was the first person, and perhaps the last, to toast cheese in the great Italian fireplace. That he did not know a geranium from a carnation, an oak from a birch tree, a mastiff from a greyhound, a teg from a yew, wheat from barley, plow land from fallow, was ignorant of the rotation of the crops, thought oranges grew underground and turnips on trees, preferred airy townscape to any landscape, all this and much more amazed Orlando, who had never met anybody of his kind before. Even the maids, who despised him, tittered at his jokes, and the men-servants, who loathed him, hung about to hear his stories. Indeed, the house had never been so lively as now that he was there, all of which gave Orlando a great deal to think about, and caused him to compare this way of life with the old. He recalled the sort of talk he had been used to about the king of Spain's apoplexy or the mating of a bitch, he bethought him how the day passed between the stables and the dressing closet, he remembered how the lord snored over their wine and hated anybody who woke them up. He bethought him how active and valiant they were in body, how slothful and timid in mind. Worried by these thoughts, and unable to strike a proper balance, he came to the conclusion that he had admitted to his house a plaguy spirit of unrest that would never suffer him to sleep sound again. At the same moment Nick Green came to precisely the opposite conclusion. Lying in bed of a morning on the softest pillows between the smoothest sheets and looking out of his oriel window upon turf which for three centuries had known neither dandelion nor dockweed, he thought that unless he could somehow make his escape, he should be smothered alive. Getting up and hearing the pigeons coo, dressing and hearing the fountains fall, he thought that unless he could hear the drays roar upon the cobbles of Fleet Street, he would never write another line. If this goes on much longer, he thought, hearing the footman mend the fire and spread the table with silver dishes next door, I shall fall asleep and, here he gave a prodigious yawn, sleeping die. So he sought Orlando in his room, and explained that he had not been able to sleep a wink all night because of the silence. Indeed, the house was surrounded by a park fifteen miles in circumference and a wall ten feet high, silence, he said, was of all things the most oppressive to his nerves. He would end his visit, by Orlando's leave, that very morning. Orlando felt some relief at this, yet also a great reluctance to let him go. The house, he thought, would seem very dull without him. On parting, for he had never yet liked to mention the subject, he had the temerity to press his play upon the death of Hercules upon the poet and ask his opinion of it. The poet took it, muttered something about Glur and Cicero, which Orlando cut short by promising to pay the pension quarterly, whereupon Green, with many protestations of affection, jumped into the coach and was gone. The great hall had never seemed so large, so splendid, or so empty as the chariot rolled away. Orlando knew that he would never have the heart to make toasted cheese in the Italian fireplace again. He would never have the wit to crack jokes about Italian pictures, never have the skill to mix punch as it should be mixed, a thousand good quips and cranks would be lost to him. Yet what a relief to be out of the sound of that querulous voice, what a luxury to be alone once more, so he could not help reflecting, as he unloosed the mastiff which had been tied up these six weeks because it never saw the poet without biting him. Nick Green was set down at the corner of Fetter Lane that same afternoon, and found things going on much as he had left them. Mrs. Green, that is to say, was giving birth to a baby in one room, Tom Fletcher was drinking gin in another. Books were tumbled all about the floor, dinner, such as it was, was set on a dressing table where the children had been making mud pies. But this, Green felt, was the atmosphere for writing, here he could write, and write he did. The subject was made for him. A noble lord at home. A visit to a nobleman in the country, his new poem was to have some such title as that. Seizing the pen with which his little boy was tickling the cat's ears, and dipping it in the egg cup which served for ink pot, Green dashed off a very spirited satire there and then. It was done to a turn that no one could doubt that the young lord who was roasted was Orlando, his most private sayings and doings, his enthusiasms and follies, down to the very color of his hair and the foreign way he had of rolling his R's, were there to the life. And if there had been any doubt about it, Green clinched the matter by introducing, with scarcely any disguise, passages from that aristocratic tragedy, The Death of Hercules, which he found as he expected, 
wordy and bombastic in the extreme. The pamphlet, which ran at once into several editions, and paid the expenses of Mrs. Green's tent lying in, was soon sent by friends who take care of such matters to Orlando himself. When he had read it, which he did with deadly composure from start to finish, he rang for the footman, delivered the document to him at the end of a pair of tongs, bade him drop it in the filthiest heart of the foulest midden on the estate. Then, when the man was turning to go he stopped him. Take the swiftest horse in the stable, he said, ride for dear life to Harwich. There embark upon a ship which you will find bound for Norway. Buy for me from the king's own kennels the finest elk hounds of the royal strain, male and female. Bring them back without delay. For, he murmured, scarcely above his breath as he turned to his books, I have done with men. The footman, who was perfectly trained in his duties, bowed and disappeared. He fulfilled his task so efficiently that he was back that day three weeks, leading in his hand a leash of the finest elk hounds, one of whom, a female, gave birth that very night under the dinner table to a litter of eight fine puppies. Orlando had them brought to his bedchamber. For, he said, I have done with men. Nevertheless, he paid the pension quarterly. Thus, at the age of thirty or thereabouts, this young nobleman had not only had every experience that life has to offer, but had seen the worthlessness of them all. Love and ambition, women and poets were all equally vain. Literature was a farce. The night after reading Green's visit to a nobleman in the country, he burnt in a great conflagration fifty-seven poetical works, only retaining the oak tree, which was his boyish dream and very short. Two things alone remained to him in which he now put any trust, dogs and nature, an elk hound and a rosebush. The world, in all its variety, life in all its complexity, had shrunk to that. Dogs and a bush were the whole of it. So feeling quit of a vast mountain of illusion, and very naked in consequence, he called his hounds to him and strode through the park. So long had he been secluded, writing and reading, that he had half forgotten the amenities of nature, which in June can be great. When he reached that high mound whence on fine days half of England with a slice of Wales and Scotland thrown in can be seen, he flung himself under his favorite oak tree and felt that if he need never speak to another man or woman so long as he lived, if his dogs did not develop the faculty of speech, if he never met a poet or a princess again, he might make out what years remained to him intolerable content. Here he came then, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. He saw the beech trees turn golden and the young ferns unfurl, he saw the moon sickle and then circular, he saw, but probably the reader can imagine the passage which should follow and how every tree and plant in the neighborhood is described first green, then golden, how moons rise and suns set, how spring follows winter and autumn summer, how night succeeds day and day night, how there is first a storm and then fine weather, how things remain much as they are for two or three hundred years or so, except for a little dust and a few cobwebs which one old woman can sweep up in half an hour, a conclusion which, one cannot help feeling, might have been reached more quickly by the simple statement that time passed, here the exact amount could be indicated in brackets, and nothing whatever happened. But time, unfortunately, though it makes animals and vegetables bloom and fade with amazing punctuality, has no such simple effect upon the mind of man. The mind of man, moreover, works with equal strangeness upon the body of time. An hour, once it lodges in the queer element of the human spirit, may be stretched to fifty or a hundred times its clock length, on the other hand, an hour may be accurately represented on the timepiece of the mind by one second. This extraordinary discrepancy between time on the clock and time in the mind is less known than it should be and deserves fuller investigation. But the biographer, whose interests are, as we have said, highly restricted, must confine himself to one simple statement, when a man has reached the age of thirty, as Orlando now had, time when he is thinking becomes inordinately long, time when he is doing becomes inordinately short. Thus Orlando gave his orders and did the business of his vast estates in a flash, but directly he was alone on the mound under the oak tree, the seconds began to round and fill until it seemed as if they would never fall. They filled themselves, moreover, with the strangest variety of objects. For not only did he find himself confronted by problems which have puzzled the wisest of men, such as what is love? What friendship? What truth? But directly he came to think about them, his whole past, which seemed to him of extreme length and variety, rushed into the falling second, swelled it a dozen times its natural size, colored it a thousand tints, and filled it with all the odds and ends in the universe. In such thinking, or by whatever name it should be called, he spent months and years of his life.
It would be no exaggeration to say that he would go out after breakfast a man of 30 and come home to dinner a man of 55 at least. Some weeks added a century to his age, others no more than three seconds at most. Altogether, the task of estimating the length of human life, of the animals we presume not to speak, is beyond our capacity, for directly we say that it ages long, we are reminded that it is briefer than the fall of a rose leaf to the ground. Of the two forces which alternately, and what is more confusing still, at the same moment, dominate our unfortunate numbskulls, brevity and deuternity, Orlando was sometimes under the influence of the elephant-footed deity, then of the gnat-winged fly. Life seemed to him of prodigious length. Yet even so, it went like a flash. But even when it stretched longest and the moment swelled biggest, and he seemed to wander alone in deserts of vast eternity, there was no time for the smoothing out and deciphering of those thickly scored parchments which thirty years among men and women had rolled tight in his heart and brain. Long before he had done thinking about love, the oak tree had put forth its leaves and shaken them to the ground a dozen times in the process, ambition would jostle it off the field, to be replaced by friendship or literature. And as the first question had not been settled, what is love? Back it would come at the least provocation or none, and hustle books or metaphors or what one lives for into the margin, there to wait till they saw their chance to rush into the field again. What made the process still longer was that it was profusely illustrated, not only with pictures, as that of old Queen Elizabeth, laid on her tapestry couch in rose-colored brocade with an ivory snuff-box in her hand and a gold-hilted sword by her side, but with scents, she was strongly perfumed, and with sounds, the stags were barking in Richmond Park that winter's day. And so, the thought of love would be all ambered over with snow and winter, with log fires burning, with Russian women, gold swords, and the bark of stags, with old King James's slobbering and fireworks and sacks of treasure in the holds of Elizabethan sailing ships. Every single thing, once he tried to dislodge it from its place in his mind, he found thus cumbered with other matter like the lump of glass which, after a year at the bottom of the sea, is grown about with bones and dragonflies, and coins and the tresses of drowned women. Another metaphor, by Jupiter. He would exclaim as he said this, which will show the disorderly and circuitous way in which his mind worked and explain why the oak tree flowered and faded so often before he came to any conclusion about love. And what's the point of it? He would ask himself. Why not say simply in so many words, and then he would try to think for half an hour, or was it two years and a half? How to say simply in so many words what love is? A figure like that is manifestly untruthful, he argued, for no dragonfly, unless under very exceptional circumstances, could live at the bottom of the sea. And if literature is not the bride and bedfellow of truth, what is she? Confound it all, he cried, why say bedfellow when one's already said bride? Why not simply say what one means and leave it? So then he tried saying the grass is green and the sky is blue and so to propitiate the austere spirit of poetry whom still, though at a great distance, he could not help reverencing. The sky is blue, he said, the grass is green. Looking up, he saw that, on the contrary, the sky is like the veils which a thousand Madonnas have let fall from their hair, and the grass fleets and darkens like a flight of girls fleeing the embraces of hairy satyrs from enchanted woods. Upon my word, he said, for he had fallen into the bad habit of speaking aloud, I don't see that one's more true than another. Both are utterly false. And he despaired of being able to solve the problem of what poetry is and what truth is, and fell into a deep dejection. And here we may profit by a pause in his soliloquy to reflect how odd it was to see Orlando stretched there on his elbow on a June day and to reflect that this fine fellow with all his faculties about him and a healthy body, witnessed cheeks and limbs, a man who never thought twice about heading a charge or fighting a duel, should be so subject to the lethargy of thought, and rendered so susceptible by it, that when it came to a question of poetry, or his own competence in it, he was as shy as a little girl behind her mother's cottage door. In our belief, Green's ridicule of his tragedy hurt him as much as the princess's ridicule of his love. But to return. Orlando went on thinking. He kept looking at the grass and at the sky and trying to bethink him what a true poet, who has his verses published in London, would say about them. Memory meanwhile, whose habits have already been described, kept steady before his eyes the face of Nicholas Green, as if that sardonic loose-lipped man, treacherous as he had proved himself, were the muse in person, and it was to him that Orlando must do homage. So Orlando, that summer morning, offered him a variety of phrases, some plain, others figured, and Nick Green kept shaking his head and sneering and muttering something about Glur and Cicero and the death of poetry in our time. At length, 
starting to his feet, it was now winter and very cold, Orlando swore one of the most remarkable oaths of his lifetime, for it bound him to a servitude than which none is stricter. I'll be blasted, he said, if I ever write another word, or try to write another word, to please Nick Green or the muse. Bad, good, or indifferent, I'll write, from this day forward, to please myself, and here he made as if he were tearing a whole budget of papers across and tossing them in the face of that sneering, loose-lipped man. Upon which, as a cur ducks if you stoop to shy a stone at him, memory ducked her effigy of Nick Green out of sight, and substituted for it, nothing whatever. But Orlando, all the same, went on thinking. He had indeed much to think of. For when he tore the parchment across, he tore, in one rending, the scrolloping, emblazoned scroll which he had made out in his own favor in the solitude of his room appointing himself, as the king appoints ambassadors, the first poet of his race, the first writer of his age, conferring eternal immortality upon his soul and granting his body a grave among laurels and the intangible banners of a people's reverence perpetually. Eloquent as this all was, he now tore it up and threw it into the dustbin. Fame, he said, is like, and since there was no Nick Green to stop him, he went on to revel in images of which we will choose only one or two of the quietest, a braided coat which hampers the limbs, a jacket of silver which curbs the heart, a painted shield which covers a scarecrow, etc. etc. The pith of his phrases was that while fame impedes and constricts, obscurity wraps about a man like a mist, obscurity is dark, ample, and free, obscurity lets the mind take its way unimpeded. Over the obscure man is poured the merciful suffusion of darkness. None knows where he goes or comes. He may seek the truth and speak it, he alone is free, he alone is truthful, he alone is at peace. And so he sank into a quiet mood, under the oak tree, the hardness of whose roots, exposed above the ground, seemed to him rather comfortable than otherwise. Sunk for a long time in profound thoughts as to the value of security, and the delight of having no name, but being like a wave which returns to the deep body of the sea, thinking how obscurity rids the mind of the irk of envy and spite, how it sets running in the veins the free waters of generosity and magnanimity, and allows giving and taking without thanks offered or praise given, which must have been the way of all great poets, he supposed, though his knowledge of Greek was not enough to bear him out, for, he thought, Shakespeare must have written like that, and the church builders built like that, anonymously, needing no thanking or naming, but only their work in the daytime and in the little ale perhaps at night, what an admirable life this is, he thought, stretching his limbs out under the oak tree. And why not enjoy it this very moment? The thought struck him like a bullet. Ambition dropped like a plummet. Rid of the heartburn of rejected love, and of vanity rebuked, and all the other stings and pricks which the nettle bed of life had burnt upon him when ambitious of fame, but could no longer inflict upon one careless of glory, he opened his eyes, which had been wide open all the time, but had seen only thoughts, and saw, lying in the hollow beneath him, his house. There it lay in the early sunshine of spring. It looked a town rather than a house, but a town built, not hither and thither, as this man wished or that, but circumspectly, by a single architect with one idea in his head. Courts and buildings, gray, red, plum color, lay orderly and symmetrical, the courts were some of them oblong and some square, in this was a fountain, in that a statue, the buildings were some of them low, some pointed, here was a chapel, there a belfry. Spaces of the greenest grass lay in between and clumps of cedar trees and beds of bright flowers, all were clasped, yet so well set out was it that it seemed that every part had room to spread itself fittingly, by the roll of a massive wall, while smoke from innumerable chimneys curled perpetually into the air. This vast, yet ordered building, which could house a thousand men and perhaps two thousand horses, was built, Orlando thought, by workmen whose names are unknown. Here have lived, for more centuries than I can count, the obscure generations of my own obscure family. Not one of these Richards, Johns, Anns, Elizabeths has left a token of himself behind him, yet all, working together with their spades and their needles, their lovemaking and their childbearing have left this. Never had the house looked more noble and humane. Why, then, had he wished to raise himself above them? For it seemed vain and arrogant in the extreme to try to better that anonymous work of creation, the labors of those vanished hands. Better was it to go unknown and leave behind you an arch, a potting shed, a wall where peaches ripen, than to burn like a meteor and leave no dust. For after all, he said, kindling as he looked at the great house on the greensward below, the unknown lords and ladies who live there never forgot to set aside something for those who come after, for the roof that will leak, for the tree that will fall, 
There was always a warm corner for the old shepherd in the kitchen, always food for the hungry, always their goblets were polished, though they lay sick, and their windows were lit though they lay dying. Lords though they were, they were content to go down into obscurity with the mole catcher and the stonemason. Obscure noblemen, forgotten builders, thus he apostrophized them with a warmth that entirely gainsaid such critics as called him cold, indifferent, slothful, the truth being that equality often lies just on the other side of the wall from where we seek it, thus he apostrophized his house and race in terms of the most moving eloquence, but when it came to the peroration, and what is eloquence that lacks a peroration? He fumbled. He would have liked to have ended with a flourish to the effect that he would follow in their footsteps and add another stone to their building. Since, however, the building already covered nine acres, to add even a single stone seemed superfluous. Could one mention furniture in a peroration? Could one speak of chairs and tables and mats to lie besides people's beds? For whatever the peroration wanted, that was what the house stood in need of. Leaving his speech unfinished for the moment, he strode downhill again, resolved henceforward to devote himself to the furnishing of the mansion. The news, that she was to attend him instantly, brought tears to the eyes of good old Mrs. Grimsditch, now grown somewhat old. Together they perambulated the house. The towel horse in the king's bedroom, and that was King Jamie, my lord, she said, hinting that it was many a day since a king had slept under their roof, but the odious parliament days were over and there was now a crown in England again, lacked a leg, there were no stands to the ewers in the little closet leading into the waiting room of the duchess's page, Mr. Green had made a stain on the carpet with his nasty pipe smoking, which she and Judy, for all their scrubbing, had never been able to wash out. Indeed, when Orlando came to reckon up in the matter of furnishing with rosewood chairs and cedarwood cabinets, with silver basins, china bowls, and Persian carpets, every one of the 365 bedrooms which the house contained, he saw that it would be no light one, and if some thousands of pounds of his estate remained over, these would do little more than hang a few galleries with tapestry, set the dining hall with fine, carved chairs, and provide mirrors of solid silver and chairs of the same metal, for which he had an inordinate passion, for the furnishing of the royal bedchambers. He now set to work in earnest, as we can prove beyond a doubt if we look at his ledgers. Let us glance at an inventory of what he bought at this time, with the expenses totted up in the margin, but these we omit. To fifty pairs of Spanish blankets, ditto curtains of crimson and white taffeta, the valence to them of white satin embroidered with crimson and white silk. To seventy yellow satin chairs and sixty stools, suitable with their buckram covers to them all. To sixty-seven walnut tree tables. To seventeen dozen boxes containing each dozen five dozen of Venice glasses. To one hundred and two mats, each thirty yards long. To ninety-seven cushions of crimson damask laid with silver parchment lace and footstools of cloth of tissue and chairs suitable. To fifty branches for a dozen lights apiece. Already, it is an effect lists have upon us, we are beginning to yawn. But if we stop, it is only that the catalogue is tedious, not that it is finished. There are ninety-nine pages more of it and the total sum dispersed ran into many thousands, that is to say millions of our money. And if his day was spent like this, Lord Orlando might be found reckoning out what it would cost to level a million molehills, if the men were paid tenpence an hour, and, again, how many hundredweights of nails at fivepence halfpenny a gill were needed to repair the fence round the park, which was fifteen miles in circumference. And so on and so on. The tale, we say, is tedious, for one cupboard is much like another, and one molehill not much different from a million. Some pleasant journeys it cost him, and some fine adventures. As, for instance, when he set a whole city of blind women near Bruges to stitch hangings for a silver canopy bed, and the story of his adventure with a moor in Venice of whom he bought, but only at the sword's point, his lacquered cabinet might, in other hands, prove worth the telling. Nor did the work lack variety, for here would come, drawn by teams from Sussex, great trees, to be sawn across and laid along the gallery for flooring, and then a chest from Persia, stuffed with wool and sawdust, from which, at last, he would take a single plate, or one topaz ring. At length, however, there was no room in the galleries for another table, no room on the tables for another cabinet, no room in the cabinet for another rose bowl, no room in the bowl for another handful of potpourri, there was no room for anything anywhere. In short, the house was furnished. In the garden snowdrops, crocuses, hyacinths, magnolias, roses, lilies, asters, the dahlia in all its varieties, pear trees and apple trees and cherry trees and mulberry trees, with an enormous quantity of rare and flowering shrubs, of trees evergreen and perennial, 
grew so thick on each other's roots that there was no plot of earth without its bloom, and no stretch of sward without its shade. In addition, he had imported wild fowl with gay plumage, and two Malay bears, the surliness of whose manners concealed, he was certain, trusty hearts. All now was ready, and when it was evening and the innumerable silver sconces were lit and the light airs which forever moved about the galleries stirred the blue and green heiress, so that it looked as if the huntsmen were riding and Daphne flying. When the silver shone and lacquer glowed and wood kindled, when the carved chairs held their arms out and dolphins swam upon the walls with mermaids on their backs, when all this and much more than all this was complete and to his liking, Orlando walked through the house with his elk hounds following and felt content. He had matter now, he thought, to fill out his peroration. Perhaps it would be well to begin the speech all over again. Yet, as he paraded the galleries he felt that still something was lacking. Chairs and tables, however richly gilt and carved, sofas, resting on lion's paws with swan's necks curving under them, beds even of the softest swan's down are not by themselves enough. People sitting in them, people lying in them improve them amazingly. Accordingly Orlando now began a series of very splendid entertainments to the nobility and gentry of the neighborhood. The 365 bedrooms were full for a month at a time. Guests jostled each other on the 52 staircases. 300 servants bustled about the pantries. Banquets took place almost nightly. Thus, in a very few years Orlando had worn the nap off his velvet, and spent the half of his fortune, but he had earned the good opinion of his neighbors, held a score of offices in the county, and was annually presented with perhaps a dozen volumes dedicated to his lordship in rather fulsome terms by grateful poets. For though he was careful not to consort with writers at that time and kept himself always aloof from ladies of foreign blood, still, he was excessively generous both to women and to poets, and both adored him. But when the feasting was at its height and his guests were at their revels, he was apt to take himself off to his private room alone. There when the door was shut, and he was certain of privacy, he would have out an old writing book, stitched together with silk stolen from his mother's workbox, and labeled in a round schoolboy hand, the oak tree, a poem. In this he would write till midnight chimed and long after. But as he scratched out as many lines as he wrote in, the sum of them was often, at the end of the year, rather less than at the beginning, and it looked as if in the process of writing the poem would be completely unwritten. For it is for the historian of letters to remark that he had changed his style amazingly. His floridity was chastened, his abundance curbed, the age of prose was congealing those warm fountains. The very landscape outside was less stuck about with garlands and the briars themselves were less thorned and intricate. Perhaps the senses were a little duller and honey and cream less seductive to the palate. Also that the streets were better drained than the houses better lit had its effect upon the style, cannot be doubted. One day he was adding a line or two with enormous labor to the oak tree, a poem, when a shadow crossed the tail of his eye. It was no shadow, he soon saw, but the figure of a very tall lady in riding hood and mantle crossing the quadrangle on which his room looked out. As this was the most private of the courts, and the lady was a stranger to him, Orlando marveled how she had got there. Three days later the same apparition appeared again, and on Wednesday noon appeared once more. This time, Orlando was determined to follow her, nor apparently was she afraid to be found, for she slackened her steps as he came up and looked him full in the face. Any other woman thus caught in a lord's private grounds would have been afraid, any other woman with that face, headdress, and aspect would have thrown her mantilla across her shoulders and hid it. For this lady resembled nothing so much as a hare, a hare startled, but obdurate, a hare whose timidity is overcome by an immense and foolish audacity, a hare that sits upright and glowers at its pursuer with great bulging eyes, with ears erect but quivering, with nose pointed, but twitching. This hare, however, was six feet high and wore a headdress into the bargain of some antiquated kind which made her look still taller. Thus confronted, she stared at Orlando with a stare in which timidity and audacity were most strongly combined. First, she asked him, with a proper, but somewhat clumsy curtsy, to forgive her intrusion. Then, rising to her full height again, which must have been something over six feet too, she went on to say, but with such a cackle of nervous laughter, so much tee-heeing and haw-hawing that Orlando thought she must have escaped from a lunatic asylum, that she was the Archduchess Harriet Griselda of Finster Orhorn and Scandop Boom in the Romanian territory. She desired above all things to make his acquaintance, she said. She had taken lodgings over a baker's shop at the park gates. She had seen his picture and it was the image of a sister of hers who was, here she guffawed, long since dead.
She was visiting the English court. The queen was her cousin. The king was a very good fellow, but seldom went to bed sober. Here she teehed and ha ha ed again. In short, there was nothing for it but to ask her in and give her a glass of wine. Indoors, her manners regained the hauteur natural to a Romanian archduchess. And had she not shown a knowledge of wines rare in a lady, and made some observations upon firearms and the customs of sportsmen in her country, which were sensible enough, the talk would have lacked spontaneity. Jumping to her feet at last, she announced that she would call the following day, swept another prodigious curtsey, and departed. The following day, Orlando rode out. The next, he turned his back. On the third, he drew his curtain. On the fourth, it rained, and as he could not keep a lady in the wet, nor was altogether averse to company, he invited her in and asked her opinion whether a suit of armor, which belonged to an ancestor of his, was the work of Jacobi or of Top. He inclined to Top. She held another opinion. It matters very little which, but it is of some importance to the course of our story that, in illustrating her argument, which had to do with the working of the tie pieces, the Archduchess Harriet took the golden shin case and fitted it to Orlando's leg. That he had a pair of the shapeliest legs that any nobleman has ever stood upright upon has already been said. Perhaps something in the way she fastened the ankle buckle, or her stooping posture, or Orlando's long seclusion, or the natural sympathy which is between the sexes, or the burgundy, or the fire—any of these causes may have been to blame. For certainly blame there is on one side or another when a nobleman of Orlando's breeding entertaining a lady in his house, and she is elder by many years. With a face a yard long and staring eyes, dressed somewhat ridiculously too, in a mantle and riding cloak, though the season was warm, blame there is when such a nobleman is so suddenly and violently overcome by passion of some sort that he has to leave the room. But what sort of passion, it may well be asked, could this be? And the answer is double-faced as love herself. For love, but leaving love out of the argument for a moment, the actual event was this: when the Archduchess Harriet Griselda stooped to fasten the buckle. Orlando heard suddenly and unaccountably far off the beating of love's wings. The distant stir of that soft plumage roused in him a thousand memories of rushing waters, of loveliness in the snow and faithlessness in the flood. And the sound came nearer, and he blushed and trembled, and he was moved as he had thought never to be moved again. And he was ready to raise his hands and let the bird of beauty alight upon his shoulders. When horror, a creaking sound like that the crows make tumbling over the trees began to reverberate. The air seemed dark with coarse black wings. Voices croaked. Bits of straw, twigs, and feathers dropped, and there pitched down upon his shoulders the heaviest and foulest of the birds, which is the vulture. Thus he rushed from the room and sent the footman to see the Archduchess Harriet to her carriage. For love, to which we may now return, has two faces: one white, the other black; two bodies, one smooth, the other hairy. It has two hands. Two feet, two tails, two indeed of every member, and each one is the exact opposite of the other. Yet, so strictly are they joined together that you cannot separate them. In this case, Orlando's love began her flight towards him with her white face turned and her smooth and lovely body outwards. Nearer and nearer she came, wafting before her airs of pure delight. All of a sudden, at the sight of the Archduchess, presumably, she wheeled about, turned the other way round, showed herself black, hairy, brutish. And it was lust the vulture, not love, the bird of paradise, that flopped foully and disgustingly upon his shoulders. Hence he ran, hence he fetched the footman. But the harpy is not so easily banished as all that. Not only did the archduchess continue to lodge at the baker's, but Orlando was haunted every day and night by phantoms of the foulest kind. Vainly, it seemed, had he furnished his house with silver and hung the walls with arras, when at any moment a dung bedraggled fowl could settle upon his writing table. There she was, flopping about among the chairs. He saw her waddling ungracefully across the galleries. Now she perched, top heavy upon a fire screen. When he chased her out, back she came and pecked at the glass till she broke it. Thus realizing that his home was uninhabitable and that steps must be taken to end the matter instantly, he did what any other young man would have done in his place and asked King Charles to send him as ambassador extraordinary to Constantinople. The king was walking in Whitehall. Nell Gwyn was on his arm. She was pelting him with hazel nuts. Twas a thousand pities that amorous lady sighed that such a pair of legs should leave the country. Howbeit, the fates were hard. She could do no more than toss one kiss over her shoulder before Orlando sailed.